Oh, sorry, yeah. The one thing that struck me about the whole presentation this morning is that um, it's really the next generation that are pushing the boundaries. <laughs> you know, I'm in my mid-50s, and um, I talk a lot about pain, but I probably don't do it. I don't probably don't work with it on a daily basis. But um, your own experiences talking with your managers and your directors of your companies, um, um, do you find that at the most senior level, that the decision makers and leaders of construction of these businesses um, are embracing technology and believe in the benefits that this can bring their businesses. Mm -hmm. Should be a mic there, Andy. Yeah. Hopefully it'll work. Yeah. Just, just to kick it off a bit. Yeah. So I know in Coffee Group, anyway, it's very much top down approach. It's top down approach people talk about, but isn't actually implemented everywhere. Um, when we do train, when we do training, especially at the beginning. We had our group chairman and our managing director sitting in in a lot of the training sessions. Right. So again, they're busy people. For them to, yeah. first of all, give st want it and give time staff the time to implement and train. The fact that they're there as well, um, it's a very positive sign for the company. So they're investing in the in the people. They're investing in the in the training and they're investing in the hardware that you need for this type of thing. Yeah. And again, because they know first of all, clients are looking for it, and long term that they'll, they'll see the payback. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so Perfect. basically, same here. Like uh, we would invest a lot of money, like uh, to the software training. Uh, like we've been sent to UK to do that level two training. So you know that was like twice. So yes. Yeah, it's a lot of money, and like um, like um, even we got two 3D printers, but there is not enough people, or we don't have enough time to be test them, to be testing them. Like you know, so yeah. there is money there. So yeah. Uh, I suppose I think you need to see the results as well. So if there's a top-down <coughs> approach, I think the directors and the companies need to see the results also. Um, yeah, they, want to, they want to win work. They want to win awards as well. They want yes. to win work. If it comes up in a tender, they have to meet those requirements. So I suppose yeah. the first time I was introduced to the whole concept was in GMIT, but when you went out into industry and it came up in a tender, they're like, what's this? You know, that, mm. That's really where... So it's client-driven. But then, I suppose there has to be buy-in then from the directors from the top. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you know, just to finish. I mean, uh, um, in my presentation again a few weeks ago, I, I changed the title um, because I just thought it was a little bit arrogant to be saying that Ireland has the opportunity to be the forefront of digital transition in the EU and around the world. Do you think that's something that we should aspire to, um, or, and you know, drill that down to a company level? You know, you want to be the best of what you do in construction, design, whatever. Uh, do you think there's a real opportunity now for Ireland, given its scale, given its position, uh, given its, um, you know, one of the last English-speaking countries in the EU? Do you think we have a real opportunity now to maybe step forward, even <coughs> beyond what the UK are doing, and take a lead in this area? Um, or, is yes. that, or is that a little bit of an, of an arrogant approach? No, I definitely think we, we can aspire to meet that and I suppose the main thing about uh, companies uh, especially in the west of Ireland and I know RPS they're they're um, they're exporting services to the UK and I know that has yeah. definitely helped them and I suppose as I said it's of critical importance to the region and if they can export services to other countries whereas our country we may you know niche areas there's some companies who just work in niche areas and if they can export their services, you know, they can build more business out of that. Absolutely. So it's all about business, isn't it, really? Any questions from the floor? Thanks. Just before that, Alan, you mentioned about for Ireland to be at the forefront. But again, like we spoke about before, is clients need to want it first, I suppose. That's our biggest yeah. battle, probably. I mean, Glen Echo were talking a few weeks ago about their, uh, their contracts in the UK. Yeah. That 75% of their businesses in the UK are climbing each year. Uh, that um, really, um, um, for them, um, you know, digital is the future. Yeah. And unless they change, they're not going to win those contracts uh, in the future. Yeah, you, know? you get left behind. So not only do we need this roadmap, and we need leadership from the Irish state, but we need leadership from the companies top down. This to be almost a big champion of the company to drive the whole agenda. You know, so. Any questions on the floor? See, they're all, they're all um, 
I don't know, I just thought I'd make, just make a comment. Uh, yes. I think it's very gratifying for somebody of my yes. age, <laughs> and also for Mary, to see three former <laughs> graduates, and also not <laughs> Mary, my colleague, to see three former graduates here leading, leading the kind of BIM revolution in the services, education, and construction areas of, you know, around the west of Ireland. And I'm delighted that, you know, that you're essentially, you know, I know I'm, Alan made a major contribution, but the rest of you have carried the, the event today. Fair play to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah well done, well done. And it's, a, and it's an example, you know, for the, so there are a lot of third and fourth year students behind us to see the opportunities that are available in this field, you know, going forward. And, and thanks. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Question here. So, I take the mic then. Shall I have Okay, great. Thank you. Um, question for Andy. Um, so in your presentation you showed a lot of automation from design through to documentation. Um, how or did you develop all the technology in house? Yes, yeah, so um, I suppose the early suppose, prototypes stuff were Dynamo. Mm -hmm. um, we still use Dynamo a small bit, but then some of it is just C, C sharp for the basic stuff exporting you're exporting data to Excel and back yeah. for a lot of it. Um, <coughs> and just not being able to export it correctly in the right formats um, the spot. Mm -hmm. and the spot wouldn't do it. So it's been a lot of errors to C sharp add-ons. And to use the AOR toolkit? Um, a small bit, but uh, so that AOR, AOR toolkit, sorry, that AOR toolkit, um, that's a company in the States that we've been kind of working with to I kind of pester them into getting the trial before they release their, their, uh, their app, I suppose. Um, so again, that's it's pretty simple, we just export from Revit to their yeah. platform. And do you see more of a requirement for this kind of automation in other projects, or is it just? Maybe not a requirement, or but it? A, a practical need for it, yeah. yeah. Um, it makes things faster, accurate, and consistent. Thanks. You always need the people, no matter how smart yeah. your tools are, you always need people to design these. It's like them, it's, it's for the people, not the technology. But it's it helps an awful lot and makes the process a lot easier. Yeah. Thanks. So I ask, were the, were the fitters working from two leads that you cut off the model or did you get So that, that, that exact drawing, say, for that segment, you saw the drawing? Yeah. Would you pull it up? Or? No, it's fine. Well, I just wanted to... Um, do they, they were using that exact drawing to create it as well as they, uh, <coughs> on a, a tablet down there. They, they had, had a tablet? Yeah, they had the models. Um, more so just to visually see how it's going to be built rather than taking information off it. But again, each of those elements are numbered on it and they can click on it and know, oh, that's one. This is one here. Does that tablet have to have mobility, connect connectivity, or can it be... Yeah. Well, it's, it's in our workshop. It's, it's on our Wi-Fi okay. system. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, really. From Stuart's... Um, how do they find their subcontractors are embracing uh, oh. the, the, the bright new future? Uh, well, everyone's at the different level. Let's start with that. And uh, a mic there. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. So, uh, like some of them, they would be ahead, and like architects, our architects would be very good. Like you know, they're really top of the class, and. Uh, some wouldn't be like, you know, <laughs> they they just starting, you know. Everyone's at the different different level, so. Just to like. follow along, uh, how are stewards enabling them to become uh, more competent? Uh, basically on this level two project, yeah. Uh, so the naming convention, this is something that has to be like, you know, it has to be in use. So um, we had like a bit of the issues there with uh, like people not following the naming convention. But that's why you have the information manager who's uh, you know looking after the CDE and basically all that. But we would provide the training and uh, like you know the Navis works or and the viewing the models, yeah, to bring them up to speed. And same thing, yeah. Um, I have seen on sites where it has caused a few issues, like it was not written into the contract. Um, that caused major issues for the subcontractor, and then they turn around at construction stage and say you need a bit model, and that that's causing issues. And then they're going out and getting external people to do it, and they're fleecing them. So you need to be a small bit careful who we get to do these things. You 
Um, for both Orson and I guess um, <coughs> both companies you've mentioned would have particular drivers and permit to do what you do just now. Um, and I guess working with consultants particularly, are you guys seeing much pushback? Or uh, are they coming on the journey in terms of the, the common BIM approach and, and particularly the model? Or are they still kind of traditional, more traditional just now? Right the now? consultants? Yeah, particularly the consultants. So on the last couple of tenders we've done, we've gotten models from the consultants actually, which makes our life an awful lot easier. Was there much um, pushback on that, or was that a fight, or were they coming on? A couple of requests to get them, and then we got them. Okay. So, um, not a huge amount of pushback, and it just makes everyone's life easier. Um, there's no reinventing the wheel either. So, it's, it's getting there, but again, until the client really decides they want it, it's like some Irish water, so there in the middle where I suppose we're uh, guiding them writing their BIM strategy and what they actually want and what they need. Mm -hmm. So until that's finished and they, they have the real hour and everything ready to go, then I don't know. But there still so will be a small bit of pushback on that. So. Mm -hmm. Same here. <coughs> Depends. I, I'm just wondering how seamless is the design construction into FA and you mentioned Maximo. Yeah. That's the preferred FM That's their software. Irish Water. Water. Yeah, so they're essentially an, a, an asset management company, really. Yeah, but Maximo is um, used by like Intel. Oh, it's massive. Like it's that's that's almost the you know the the gold standard. Yeah. When you talk about FDI facilities, you know, uh, major um, um, you know pharmaceutical facilities and so on. That must have been the, a game changer for them when you said that you could give them that you could provide that data directly into the system. Um, yeah, they were, they were fairly happy with it. Um, Is that the thing that's small for them, or? You uh, were saying they weren't convinced, that they're not specifying it on their projects. Um, yeah, so I suppose they, they knew they, they needed it, but um, just hadn't seen the benefits of it. So that might have been the best thing to give them the next step to move on. Because if they didn't have it, they'd have to keep the information in themselves. Yeah. In the system, which seems a bit. We all know how that goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. So Can I just make one point yes, in Mary. relation to what, yeah. what you were talking about there? I, th I think that at the end of the day, that the client the client is the one who's pushing it, but because they see the value for money, they, they, there's loads of, of you know, um, benefits to them. Mm. But I think the issue we have is that the clients, particularly at you know, kind of a more local level, aren't actually been aware of it, they've been made aware of it by the um, consultant team. So that's causing a different thing because no client that wouldn't like to see a walk through their building and see what's happening. But that information isn't actually been made available at an area of state. And that's more to do with yeah. was smaller scale stuff. The, the bigger scale stuff and certainly the <coughs> the infrastructure projects and stuff like that at a very large scale are, are mm. you know, the demand is there for that, you know, mm. at, at government level. When you get to smaller clients, it's not what I would imagine if, if they know about it, <laughs> they might aware of that what they will look for. So it's, it's an issue, I suppose, for us in GMIT and for the graduates to make sure that they're working with the right um, yeah. skill set, you know, yeah. so that they can be valuable in a, in a practice. Yeah. And it's kind of often a cheaper way for consultants to bring them in rather than, you know, uh, yeah. bring people who have, uh, you know, yeah. a, a huge amount of expertise. Yeah. It's, it's actually something we were caught right up to. It's something we saw in all of the other three events we, we recently been to, and we'll see it, I suspect, this afternoon and tomorrow morning as well. In other words, local capability, colleges doing it locally, <coughs> companies doing it locally. And I just want to put this out there as something to think about. Um, um, when the alliance was set up in 1999-2000, the whole idea behind it was that we would be stronger together than separately, not for profit, technology agnostic, uh, you know, with innovation at, at, at its core. Um, this virtual, this center of excellence they're talking about in the roadmap, uh, they don't really know what that looks like at the moment. That doesn't actually have to be a physical center. That could be an entity which has, has nine uh, nodes or 10 points of contact sitting in each of the regions, fed it into the local colleges. So for example, GMIT, Sligo IT, Cork IT, uh, Waterford IT, DIT, Dundalk, Letterkenny, all have an a part and a role to play in this new center of excellence. The center of excellence is just an entity, it's a legal entity, it's not profit, whatever. I think some consideration should be given for that because there's no point in building a center that's sitting in the east or whatever, or it's not connected into um, 
you know, the other, the other, the other points. So I think that if there's going to be a proposal put forward, uh, it could come from the regional network as a proposition for right across the country in, in the IOTs and the universities, everyone come together with a single kind of vision uh, to form a centre which then has outreach centres that are focused on serving a local need, but also adding to the larger national need, which is the roadmap. So what I would hope would happen is that boardrooms around the country, companies, are taking the roadmap and talking about it at corporate level, saying we, you know, we need to sign up to this. And also the IOTs, from the presidents down, directors of the colleges, are also so the brand of NBC is not just a brand owned by someone in the East Coast, you know, Enterprise Ireland. It's actually owned by everyone, and it's a badge going forward. You know, it's more like a kind of community of practice. A, a community of practice. You know, if we didn't build the alliance ten years ago for it to suddenly wither and vines, like it needs to keep strong. And you have a strong regional centre here, and that centre should be you know, that should be your area. You know. Uh, but, but linking into a wider sort of vision and network going forward. So that's really the kind of thing we're, we're thinking about at the moment and how that might look and how that could be funded and, and, and so on and so forth, you know. Okay, and as I say, I didn't mention them, but the sponsors this morning, I mean, the technology vendor, that's really where the innovation is. That's where the R&D is. That's where the investment is taking place. And these companies that are pushing the technologies, like what Andy talked about, they need to be part of it as well, because they're going to help us fund it. The Irish government are going to fund everything. The Irish government are going to fund part of it, but also the technology companies and the companies that are at this table here need to also play a role in funding it going forward. You know? Anyway, it's a challenge, um, but some great stories. Okay, maybe one, maybe any last question? Yes. I asked a question there, just maybe uh, just on Stuart's uh, presentation there, uh, how did you find getting the likes of the asset register approved on the client? In my experience, the NDFA, OPW and the HSC don't seem to have a grasp of what their asset register is at this stage and they seem to be uh, unsure of what it is they want to be in. How, how did you find that process with the client? Uh, well, sure at the time. I'm probably not the right person to ask, uh, but uh, like we would, um, we would have the external uh, specialists, the DFM systems, and they would be looking after the FM side of it. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to really worry about that. Okay. Yeah. If that answers the question. In different parts of it, they're asking for more than they need, and other parts, they're not asking for enough. So it was something that I've seen anyway in the AORs that wasn't fleshed out enough is the yeah. information exchange, like the Kobe, things like that, that they kind of say we want Kobe, but they need to go into a bit more detail yeah. as to what they actually want in it. While I suppose Kobe's a standard, yeah. in their heads, they're looking for a bit more on certain aspects and less than others. Um, like, do you think you're just saying, I want Kobe? I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I'm going, I just want it because... Because the red in mind, they should have it. Yeah. It. yeah. Is it more well, it, in some cases, and in some cases not. Well, I think, um, just to pick up Michelle's point, I mean, the part of the, 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 the proposition for the roadmap as well is, I mentioned it in that piece, that diagram of the collaboration, is to develop guidelines around, say, EIOs. You know, you know the, the OAI have developed a, a template. But what about a template that the uh, National Development Council produce in association with academia, industry, and government, that they agree on a template, and then that then goes out to all clients, that they can pick, that they can pick the standard template, or they can, you know, and there might be examplers of templates that you could use, say, in a school project, or a hospital project, or a road project, or, or, or what, you know, that, that really is the badge that's saying, this is good practice, 
this is this is how to complete the ER, or this is this is how you complete the fields, and to make sure they know what it is they're asking, you know. And so it's a huge amount of work <coughs> to be done there. I mean, the the the, the, the challenge. The challenge for the government is actually quite vast. You know, uh, they have to produce the technical guidance documents, and that's a big ask for them. So they're going to need um, people to do that. You know? Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. So I think we're almost yeah. there. This was one of the questions we might wrap it up. Um, okay. It was a great event. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks, uh, John.